Cool. So um, if you don't want to be recorded, then uh, hide your screen. But otherwise, welcome. This is a uh, 10G Online Connect. So um, the whole uh, purpose of this is to obviously widen your network uh, beyond your 10G group uh, regionally and well nationally really um, and then obviously bring some educational speakers to you as well so um, today we have um, Ainsley um, from Fix HR um, speaking to us and um, while we're in the session I would just ask that you mute yourselves um, so as not to unless she's obviously asking for um, some interaction then feel free to pipe up um, and then there'll be a, a short Q&A afterwards, and then after that, you'll have a chance to introduce yourself. Um, but back to Ainsley. So the topic she's going to be talking about today is if you can't beat him, join him. And this is in relation to how the Employee Relations Act can help make your business better. So um, Ainsley herself has worked with over 3,000 business owners since moving to New Zealand about 10 years ago. And... Um, Fix HR is a thorough, refreshing, kind of personal and useful um, uh, resource. It's uh, available for any, any businesses, you know. And um, Ainsley herself is a mum of uh, three kids. And um, yeah, it's, um, it's a pleasure to have you on the chat. So please um, take it away. Take it away. Thank you, Dan. Let me just iron out a couple of a couple of details there. It's difficult when you read someone's bio and they and, and you speak it out. I haven't actually got 3,000 clients, but I've met with over 3,000 business owners in the last probably four and a half years. Uh, we moved back to New Zealand from living in Spain 10 years ago. I had a business in Spain. We've set Fix HR up because the the majority of the business owners that I've spent time with in the last five years have got uh, issues in their business with their staff. And I figured if we could give people a tool um, to, to put things in their proper place to get their T's crossed and I's dotted, then that's something that is typically very stressful for business owners put in its proper place. And so that's the sort of genius behind Fix HR. Um, Thank you for your intro, Dan. I'm just wondering, is there, do I have facility to share my screen to put my um, a PowerPoint up? Yeah, absolutely. So you should Perfect. have a toggle at the bottom of your screen too. Will I just do that Bring now it. and it's not going to say I don't have a problem with that? Perfect. You should be able to uh, get straight into it. All right. Um, I'll come here. Perfect. That's sharing now. I'll put that up there. Would it be um, okay? Which I was thinking we'd have a little a little trial run before I, I was doing this. Maybe I'll get you all out and then because I'm oh yeah, that's much better. Okay, um, Dan, before you take yourself yes. uh, off mic again, can anyone see me or no? They yes. only see my screen. Oh, we can. Uh, depending on the, you can see your screen and then there's a. A window in the sidebar. All right, don't pick my nose. Somebody might notice. Okay, anyway, so right. Fix HR, this is me. Um, Laurie Wilson works with me, as does Lisa Young. We're building our team, should have another employee by the end of the year. Um, we are all very familiar with small business. We're not HR practitioners that are very theoretical. We understand um, that uh, the conversations we ask our clients to have with their staff have to be had, leaving them on the shelf or, or a good idea without actually um, getting any legs on them just does nobody any favors. So we're very aware that uh, the concept of HR has got a lot of bad press. People, people typically feel a bit negative about it. Um, it feels oftentimes it's too little too late. Something's gone wrong in a business and you have to get an HR specialist or an employment lawyer involved. Um, people have a sense that the government has loaded onto their businesses all sorts of obligations and um, uh, staff have entitlements. What about the poor employer? This is the type of attitude that uh, we're very familiar with. And, and I think the, the people that are involved in Fix HR really understand that. And we want to leverage out of that space to say there are all sorts of things that 
you can do ahead of time and set up so that you're not caught at the bottom of the cliff. We, we set you up so that you can um, uh, take advantage of the benefits that are in the Employment Relations Act. So, um, the, my big concept is this, that it, that it is possible for that Employment Relations Act um, to make things better for small business owners. It is that uh, it isn't necessarily designed for us. Mm -hmm. It is that the Employment Relations Act is designed for vulnerable employees. The, the Act is in place for constituents who are going to vote for uh, their preferred um, political party. And, and, it's, and it's designed for the, the biggest group of society, which are employees. Um, and you could see that as, as um, just difficult and really hard. Or you could say, where is the opportunity in that for us as employers? So to understand something of the lie of the land, and in my experience, few employers know this ahead of time. They sort of are learning as they go if something comes up with their, with their staff. Uh, who is the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment? What's mediation and, and what's the employment court? I often hear of employers really anxious because their staff have said, I'm going to take you to court and you can't do this and I need that. Let's just understand the rules of this game that we are all in, understand who the players are and, and, and the lie of the board, if you like. So the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, um, it's a very big, um, uh, an old speak government department. It's a ministry that looks after all sorts of things, including the health and safety aspect of who we are as businesses. But in terms of employment, it is the, the regulator of the Employment Relations Act, which is there to protect employees. There is no piece of law in place to protect employers. So uh, MB is uh, they're the other ones who run the, the government website around employment. Employees and employers go to that site to say, hey, surely this isn't right. Is there, is there not some support there for me? Um, when employers go there and they're looking for some specific support, the MB helpline will tell you, you need to speak to a lawyer about this. This isn't our uh, role to advise you on this. Um, so so that's, that's the gearing. It's, it's to protect vulnerable employees. In fact, we like to live in a country that does that. We like that. Um, the majority of people are looked after by a piece of law. It does mean that as employers, um, we're oftentimes playing a game and we, we don't understand it all because we haven't read that piece of law. The Employment Relations Act 2000 um, replaced the Employment Contract Act uh, 1991. And so it's a piece of law that's now 20 years old. It's not a very easy piece of law. It's been, um, there have been amendments to it just about every year since then. But anyway, it is a piece of law that looks after the majority of New Zealanders, and it's a matter for us to um, appreciate and understand the implications. Mediation is um, a process that our employees are entitled to. It's an employee-driven process to review what's happened over the last period. It can be quite a long period to make sure that nothing unfair or unreasonable has has transpired. So that process is in place to, to filter out uh, issues and settle them down efficiently. Our job in Fix HR is to make sure things don't even need to go to mediation. You can, with the threat of mediation, button it off, tie it down, make it go away. Um, our recommendation wouldn't be that you fork out a lot of money or go to a lot of um, uh, emo go through a lot of emotional anxiety to get there. We would want some stuff in place so that these things aren't dragging on. But that's what mediation is for. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an amendment to the Employment Relations Act that says mediation is not the place for lawyers around a 90-day trial um, issue. There's a few little constraints around that, but, but basically there's a mediator, there's the employer, there's the employee, um, it's a private process. Nothing goes to the media from there. There are 
Um, uh, we sign things off to say that nobody's going to disclose anything in the process that's just been um, finished off. If the parties don't come to an agreement in mediation, and almost by definition an employer is paying here because the system is there for the employee and the employee has flagged that something has happened that they feel disenfranchised by or upset by, almost every time there's a payment, if the employer doesn't agree to pay or the employee doesn't accept the offer that the mediator has been in the middle of, um, the issue can then go further to the employment court. There are numbers around, statistics around that say something like 92% um, uh, of cases are settled in mediation. So 8% of anything that goes as far as mediation uh, uh, go forward to court. The other statistic that we hear about often, 82% uh, 80, of cases that go to the employment court uh, settled in favor of the employee. So knowing that statistic influences employers to settle in mediation even more powerfully than whatever it might cost them. So sometimes people understanding this realize, oh, okay, the, the road is long, something going wrong with my employee here. I'm, I'm not, it's not time yet to lose sleep or to fork out $40,000. This is a long process. There are a number of places, gates to go through. Um, I just think it's helpful for people to understand, understand that process. Um, the other thing that's a really important thing for people to understand is the difference between um, employees and contractors. There's been a fair bit in the news around this. I feel like, now this is my own opinion, we're, we're in the middle of a campaign. I'm not sure exactly who's driving the campaign, but. There have been a couple of cases in the last 20 months um, identifying uh, people who have signed independent contract uh, agreements as employees. So this is worth giving a little bit of time to in a market now which is um, skittish about employing people and a little maybe uh, uh, leaning toward, let me just get somebody as a contractor uh, I, I want you to understand some of the vulnerabilities around that. There is a function of hiring someone as a contractor, but take, take care with that. So the, the cases were in May last year and July this year. Um, there was um, a, well, no, a little earlier than July, Barry versus CI Builders, where a, a, a building contractor signed a contractor's agreement. Something went wrong in their relationship went to mediation, didn't settle in court. The judge decided that the way the relationship operated in practice was more of an employee-employer relationship. So um, the, the, the Mr. Baker, Mr. Barry, sorry, um, wasn't kept at arm's length around the, around the relationship. It wasn't commercially independent. He didn't set his own prices. He didn't have a variety of clients. He worked so long for uh, CI Builders that he didn't have any other time to be working for others. He was uh, using their tools, their plants. So at the end of the day, despite having signed that contractor's agreement, which in the past we would have said would have protected that employer, uh, despite having signed that, the court determined that this was actually an employee-employer relationship. The reason the court is, prefers that relationship is that the government prefers it. Um, they want people to have access to leave entitlements. They want people to be able to be saving toward their retirement. They want them to have the uh, opportunity to negotiate uh, collective agreements, believe it or not. They want stability for the employment for the majority of their people. So they prefer an employment relationship and a permanent employment relationship at that over a contractor relationship. So um, it, feels a little, it feels a little tough for employers when they want to just uh, grow their business and, and pay their taxes. But the fact that a person wouldn't have access 
to being able to review an unfair thing that's just happened to them in an employment court the government doesn't want so the 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 the, the um bias is always toward employing someone employing them permanently employing them fairly the other case uh was uh last year the leota versus parcel express again an employment uh, contractor agreement was signed, but the, the the constraints around that guy, like having to brand his vehicle, have a certain vehicle, brand at Parcel Express at his own ex expense, um, you know, work the hours. Uh, there were just a, a host of restrictive kind of constraints. So the court um, said that wasn't fair. He was actually an employee, and and um, and that and that. And that has set a precedent for us going forward. There's currently a case tossing between the employment court and the authority to say who is the one who determines whether pizza delivery people are employees or contractors. So the court has said the authority can determine that. The authority is saying, no, no, that's not our job. The court needs to determine that. So at all sorts of levels, there's all sorts of hustle going, going on. But if you just recall to yourself, need to be positioning my people in a place where they have the right to come back and say that wasn't fair. And also they're getting these other entitlements that sets them up for success. Like for example, leave if somebody's sick, um, uh, holidays just to refresh and, and uh, reset. Funny thing to be talking about in the middle of a lockdown, but nevertheless, it is an entitlement and the government wants that to continue. Um, so that's why it matters. I've got an example of um, somebody that I met once. They had a contractor because they, uh, the person wanted to be a contractor. They wanted the autonomy of being a contractor and they wanted the extra pay that being a contractor affords them. This person, I have to just be really careful. It was a tradie uh, and they liked their freedoms. Um, they like to be able to come into work once everything was done at home. They wanted to be able to not come to work when their partner was too busy. So it suited them. Uh, as time went on, tools broke and were replaced by the business. Turning up on site without the right brand on was uh, didn't work for the business. You turn up at somebody's place and who are you? So they were wearing a, a polo with some branding on. Bit by bit, the, um, the original uh, relationship slid. And this, this does happen. Um, this person went away for several weeks. Their partner had uh, finished a, another contract. They went on holiday. They were away for several weeks. And during that time, um, our client um, got a new, got an employee, uh, hired a, a, an apprentice. Person came back and felt very threatened. Some of the work that they were getting was now going elsewhere. <clears throat> Coming up to Christmas time, they got themselves in some Christmas photos and lodged a claim. The photos that they were in were used as evidence. This company had not gotten an independent contractor agreement signed. Uh, we know now that it wouldn't have made a heck of a lot of difference anymore. This was from about a year ago, this story. And, uh, and the claim stood because uh, that that employee was disadvantaged. When it came to the business building, hiring an apprentice, just redistributing the work, that disadvantaged this person and they won that claim. And there's a lot of money involved in that. So this matters. It's not just... Oh, you can't always fly under the radar. A company that feels like they're never going to have to attend to this <laughs> uh, doesn't always get away with that. So um, <clears throat> the news is not all bad, and and this is this is the tone of my of my webinar. Um, we we can't control a whole lot of stuff. Sitting and feeling irritated by that and feeling victimized by that doesn't help us grow our businesses. And there are real advantages to hiring and employing, taking advantage of what the Employment Relations Act gives us as employers. And 
you know, if uh, if it were me and I was watching this webinar, I'd probably get a screen grab of this slide because it's actually all good news. If it's an employee that you've hired, you, you've engaged them to do what you want them to do, the way you want it done, when you want it done. Technically, a contractor uh, turns up when they feel like it and does the job the way they want it to. It could be a real uh, a real rough job, but they, they've done it, it's signed off and they move on. Um, they have their own tools and equipment, which might be great or might be hopeless. When you've engaged someone as an employee, you have so much more control over more than just the job that's done when you're not watching, over your brand and over your um, reputation. You can use things like an employment agreement and like policies and procedures that you just don't have access to for your contractors. An independent contractor agreement is there and we really recommend them. Um, they're not a, a, obviously a silver bullet, but you can say, you know, if the work is not to a certain standard, you need to go back and, and, and fix that. You as the principal ought not be going back and fixing the work of a contractor. And you certainly oughtn't be the one who's wearing the burden financially. So you can set those things up properly as your independent contractor um, should be set up. Um, but for your employee, you've got um, things in place that allow you to manage your staff. A client who's come on board recently had, uh, these were employees, they were set up uh, reasonably well, but uh, there was just vagaries around discipline. And when things go wrong in that discipline space and you need to exit someone, um, th this was a, a, a very uh, obvious case of needing to get rid of somebody. There was, the police were involved. There was terrible uh, irresponsibility and, a, a, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of plant involved. Um, but within their own pre-fix HR uh, processes and documentation, it was very woolly. It was very optimistic and, and, and hoped that these things would never come up. So we came on board, we've reset all of that, but we've helped with these old systems because that was the agreement the employee was under. Really very, very light, but you have got available to you employment agreements that are very clearly determine what happens at the end of our relationship and policies that will say, these things will not be tolerated. This is how we're gonna respond. So that when the no win no fee lawyer comes in, they, there's no case to answer to. They say, well, they did what they said they would do. So I don't wanna to touch this. Again, there are no silver bullets. This is not black and white. That employee, our client's employees could still hire a lawyer or have access to a lawyer who could take a claim against our client, but at least that low hanging fruit, the no win no fee lawyer is not gonna to touch it because you know, it was set up correctly. Um, moving on, 90-day trial clause. You, you don't have that with a contractor, obviously. You get notice periods with your employees, so they don't just leave you high and dry. You have policies that give security to your staff, and that's the way the law is designed, that they have security. They can um, manage their higher purchase and their rent and whatever else. But also the employer is given that sort of security. They're not left with a project half done. Um, they're able to count on timelines and, uh, and commitments that they make. Contractors are not rooted into your business. They can easily just not show up. And who knows? But <laughs> that's exactly what they do. Surfs up. No, I don't want to come into work today. So there can be quality control issues, as we've talked about. And and a lot of stress for business owners. It is difficult to create a real workforce when you're using contractors. It is difficult to manage your brand and to develop um, some, some real foundations to build a business from when all you're dealing with is, is contractors and their availability is their own business. Back on this employee, you're able to invest in your staff, to train them and develop them, to, to give them a career path. And, um, and that's exciting for most business owners in New Zealand. We'd like to be able to 
um, invest in our people and make sure when they leave, they leave better than they were when they started. Uh, that's just not something you do with your contractors, or if it is, um, well, it wouldn't be my recommendation because they're, they're, they're an investment on legs. When you've rooted them into your business better, then that makes a lot more sense. So you're establishing a stable legal floor on which to build your business. Um, it, it's not all bad news. Having to set up employees, it, it can be it can be awesome. Um, let me just check our time. Not very much longer. Look, most businesses that we come into have used either they've used something like us in the past, and they're looking for a, a new delivery for whatever reason, or their documents have come from the MB site. The Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment have got a contract builder on their site. Since the year 2000, it's been unlawful to engage an employee without an employment agreement, gearing, of course, toward your staff. That's to protect them, not to protect you. Um, since 2016, in fact, there's been a mandatory fine that is issued uh, for engaging an employee without an employment agreement. It starts at $1,000 per employee and climbs from there. Caps at 10, not an unlimited thing. Um, so they've supplied what you need to be able to give them an employment agreement. It's a useful tool, but just be aware that anything you put in that employment agreement, you are signing up to as well as an employee. Yeah. So we strip out everything that's not necessary. We don't love a big thick duvet of an employment agreement. Sometimes the non-essential things though bring clarity and are, and are very helpful. So if you're in an industry that, for example, um, a non-negative drug test would just be catastrophic or, or, um, or, or a, a, a positive uh, alcohol level would be disastrous. You know, build in some of those things. Our expectations are this and this will happen. Not to such a degree that um, you tie your hand behind your back. I'm going to do this and 20 hours later this and you'll be given this. We don't, we don't need all of that detail. But we do want to say that there'll be a huge consequence if certain things are missed. So, so um, health and safety in certain industries drugs and alcohol in certain industries, restraints of trade in certain industries. They're not compulsory, they're useful. Sometimes if they're not, leave them out. Um, I see I've got about five minutes to go. Uh, what I wanna say is that a lot of business owners are in business because they've had a brilliant idea or a wonderful opportunity. They're entrepreneurial, they're not detailed, they're not into uh, policies and consequences unless it's informed. But if you if you go away from this webinar with one clear idea, that is that these things could be a real help to us. This is this is the the bread and butter of what the Employment Relations Act gives us as employers that we can set things up to leverage. And without this stuff in place, without agreements, without policies, without a written um, record of what's taken place and what our expectations are and what will happen if our expectations are missed, you, you're leaving some really effective tools in a toolkit. Um, so policies like leave policies, you know, give me a little bit of time to organise when you're not going to be there. Uh, dress and appearance, if that matters to you, and I say oh. to um, vehicles, drugs and alcohol, these sorts of things. Letters, letters of offer. Get your dates all nice and clearly defined there. Um, disciplinary letters, close downs, medical certificate requests. These sorts of records that you keep by way of a letter to your staff might one day save your bacon, mean there is no claim to answer to. And forms make this stuff really easy. Give them um, a form to request their leave. Get a form that you fill out when they come back from their sick leave that'll drive them to have to face up to you if they've taken a day sick leave. That entitlement has just grown. So let's make sure that we're not just giving it away. Um, a form will make that much easier. I know that lawyers are um, paid to work hard for us to sometimes change 
uh, white to black. The difficulty is when they're when they're on the other side of the table and they're doing that to us, isn't it? Um, there are all sorts of errors that people make. I could come back and we do another webinar around these sorts of things. Ignorance is no excuse. You need before the Employment Relations Act to know what you need to know. There is no excuse to say I had no idea. If I'd known I would have done that, that doesn't hold any water. There's all sorts of things that can go around 90-day uh, trial, dismissals and discipline. Think to yourself, if you've given somebody an employment agreement, you have given them the right to work. If you're withdrawing that right, then be prepared that they are going to rise up and come against that. So, so be, be prepared for that. Um, it's 11.01, Carol. That's the end of my presentation, really. Um, what I'll do is I'll hand back to you, Dan, although I do see that there are a couple of questions on that chat. Do I just open those up? Um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Ainsley. Ainsley, what we'll do is um, obviously open it to the floor uh, to uh, ask your questions either in the chat or on in person. But um, yeah, we, uh, there is a um, question there from Malcolm. So uh, yeah, yeah, Malcolm, yep. So the question, do you think, what, what is the best option for SMEs in terms of outsourcing an HR department? Malcolm, uh, of course I'm going to say that Fix HR is your best option. <laughs> it's, an, it's an excellent outsource, actually, all joking aside. Uh, it's not something that you need to pay for uh, as, as in uh, somebody sitting with that hat on all the time. When you set things up beautifully, and, and I believe that we do that, we supply employment agreements, uh, handbook of, of policies that's all heavily tailored to your business and your industry. We also give you letters and forms and tools. So that's our bundle. You reduce the chances of things going wrong and you reduce the, um, the, the requirement that you've got a whole bank of resource there to, to be dealing with that. So in my mind, when those things are great, they're very good. What we offer at Fix HR in an ongoing way is a small uh, sort of stipend that keeps us uh, at the end of the phone or the email. And uh, we know you and we love you We've wrapped around you and set you up for success. And so, so we're right there when the little things come up and you're not paying enormous amounts of money in an ongoing kind of a way. Um, there are other resources, there are other more boutique kind of HR specialists out there. Um, there are big companies, corporates that are very digitized. There are corporates that are not so digitized, but they're fun, kind of pretty expensive. So the spectrum is huge. I feel like we've navigated through and we provide a really nice resource for our clients. Um, uh, I appreciate your thanks inserting requirements to be vaccinated into new employment agreements. Thanks for asking that, Rachel. Um, you're right that you could do that for a new employee. Rachel, the, um, the risk is there for everybody that that could be contested. It's not old enough to have been contested by anybody yet. So we haven't seen it go through um, a claim, mediation, fail at mediation, get to court and the, the, the judge make a ruling. By the way, while I'm here, we've not seen that around family violence yet either. So until we see a court ruling, what we're doing is doing our best with the best intentions and with the understanding that we can't disadvantage our employees. Um, I'll say that we must not overlay the requirement to be vaccinated on existing employees, but there is the opportunity to um, have a meeting, talk together, educate and inform and encourage people to be um, uh, doing what in my opinion is the right thing, uh, but forcing them, leveraging them out, we will see cases come through the court in time because you know, that is, a, that is an obligation that we're putting on that does kind of restrict people's freedom of choice. It's a difficult question to answer. We can't answer it definitively now. If you're in an industry that 
um, you can justify this is a, a particularly important thing if you're in hospitality, if you're in sort of a first response space, you could easily justify that. If you were um, bumping up against the public all the time, you could justify it. Uh, other organizations, uh, I would probably just wait and see uh, how people go. The other thing is you could put it in and see if they just sign it. And if they do, then well done, no worry. Um, Malcolm, let's take it offline in terms of cost. What we've done for, for Fix HR is make our service very accessible to small businesses. What small businesses typically have in the market is access to cheap and cheerful, which in my opinion is better than nothing, but uh, you still need to know what to look for in that cheap, cheerful bundle of resources or small businesses are paying a fortune to be looked after. What we've tried to do is provide something for small businesses that's more affordable. So Malcolm, I hope to hear from you. Um, and everybody else is just saying thank you. So we've got a fun. question there from Mark. Um, Mark, I'm not seeing it. Did I miss it? Perhaps you can read that to me. Ah, Mark, hi, Mark. Sorry, seems every reason I have some contracted workers in place is questionable or challengeable. Why would I bother? One of the things, Mark, is that um, in fact, I probably wouldn't bother if you could at all justify employing somebody on a permanent employment agreement with a low number of uh, guaranteed hours. Remember in a permanent employment agreement since 2016, you need to specify your minimum number of hours in an employment agreement. You might reduce your market um, and that might be difficult. You might only be able to access your muscle power that you want by people who will only be contractors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I will say uh, I've got clients whose staff mm -hmm. will not be employees because they've got their truck, they mm -hmm. drive around in their big ute, they love it, they love the idea of all that goes with being a tradie and owning all that stuff. They won't ever be employees. We take you through a process to reduce the risk around that if they ever contest, because right in that relationship, it's the employer who's vulnerable there. Um, so there are things that we can do to set that up to reduce risk. If it's at all possible, employ. You get you get lots of benefits. Um, if it isn't possible, there are ways that we can reduce your risk. But basically, you're you're on on. on it's a riskier place to be operating from. Um, things that you can do to reduce the risk are get your person to be working for other people, not just yourself, using their own tools, their own time, their own methodologies. All of that stuff helps reduce the uh, chance that the outcome would be that you were taking advantage of somebody. One of the things that went wrong for CI Builders was they gave the guy an independent contractor's agreement, which was signed, but they knew he really wanted a job. He needed a job. He'd been unemployed for some time. And so the ruling was they sort of took advantage of him there. That's the ruling. Um, if it was that they took him on at part-time or even 30 hours a week, allowing him to work for other people, they would have been in a stronger position. Certainly if he was working for other people, the case wouldn't have won. He, he, the employer wouldn't have lost that case. Um, the other idea is, uh, just to follow up on that, Mark, there is the possibility of a casual employee. Um, there are four ways of engaging someone. A casual, a permanent minimum number of hours. A permanent five hours a week would be fine. Or 10 hours a fortnight, or 40 hours a fortnight, or 80 hours a fortnight, but minimum number of hours. Fixed term, of course, it's got its own vulnerabilities. Independent contractor. Um, the government prefers a permanent agreement, uh, but there is the casual option. Watch that there aren't patterns that develop. The idea mm -hmm. behind this employment relationship is there is no expectation of continuity of work. So if you're getting someone every now and then to step in and do something for you, maybe rather than an independent contractor, Actually, in that case, an independent contractor would be fine, but you could also engage someone as a casual. There, there are options for you. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, 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 yeah, Mark, we probably need to catch up offline. Um, it, no, it was... we don't. Pardon? <laughs> I'm not employing people. I'm, oh, you've you know given what? up. <laughs> the, no. there, the, the rules do allow you to manage this, but not understanding until a little bit too late and not having the savvies around some things are awful. They, I have been with a lot of employ, employers that have been really, really gone through a mincer over this type of thing. And it's hard to be brave and step out again. But basically, um, yeah, there, it isn't only employee centric. We have got benefits if we understand and use it to our um, um, benefit. Diane, um, we would never recommend using the term up to 40 hours in an employment agreement. Uh, and I'm assuming that's what you're uh, inquiring about there. The, what Fix HR likes to do is uh, set up so there is no, um, there's no space for argument. If you've said up to 40 hours, but someone can establish that you had a pattern of 35 hours, and then you gave them five hours during COVID, uh, they would have the um, grounds for a claim that you've disadvantaged them. If you say, uh, I'm going to give you a minimum of 30 hours, you have to give them a minimum of 30 hours, whether they're working it or not. Let's say the delivery didn't turn up. There was no work to do. You must pay them those 30 hours. Um, but you don't have to pay them more than 30, of course. Uh, when you determine a minimum number of hours, and we, we would define that as a particular set, any hours above that, that your employees work is called overtime. There's no obligation for you to pay a special overtime rate, but they do have the option of saying, nah, man, I, um, I'm going to go and pick up my girl and we're going away. So you do have that vulnerability, but you don't have to pay them for hours that they're not working if they cannot work. So we look at patterns um, for, you know, as long as we need to, to help our mm -hmm. clients establish a really reasonable minimum number of hours and also each business is different. You've got a culture and a character of the business that many, many employees, we just work for the 40 hours regularly anyway, but we have determined that 30 is our minimum. Um, Diane, if you'd like to give me a call, we can chat about that um, uh, further if that doesn't answer your question fully. Um, Malcolm's gone, not a problem. Thanks for joining. I think there was just a, one final question from uh, Baptist around, is there any regulation if the contract employee continues for a longer period of time, are they considered employees? So that's a good question, Baptiste. It is a, a common misconception that if you've got someone on a casual agreement, you're only allowed to do that for a year. A true casual can be on a true casual agreement for five years or 10. There's no limit on that. But what it is is, for example, um, a, a transport company might have two or three casuals and they go down and pick up a truck and bring it back, give them a call. Are you able? No, I'm playing golf. No problem. Next one. There's no limit on that time. Uh, if you put somebody on a fixed term agreement, for example, a parental leave cover or a, a seasonal agreement, there's a seasonal permanent agreement that has different dates in it but you might hire someone for high season picking or something. The thing to look out for that is that the day after that agreement was due to finish, if that person comes to work and they perform their job just as they've always done, that fixed term agreement is automatically morphs into a permanent agreement. And usually fixed term agreements have got some kind of level of compensation for the insecurity and instability that comes with them. Your job is ending at this date. So we appreciate that you've taken it. And, you know, we, we, we give you, you know, 22 bucks an hour instead of 20. It locks in at 22 and it's permanent. So, so that's something to be aware of. Um, 
in terms of a contract door on a fixed period, think of it as a business to business relationship. That contractor is your, is your, is your fee for service person. If the date drags out and they're still supplying, you know, it's not actually the end of the world. Um, technically, having an employee, uh, a, a, a contractor agreement in place should keep you out of the employment court. But I've talked today about two cases where that didn't happen. So always be a little, a, a little wary. Cool. I'm glad Natalia found that useful. Everybody else, that's cool. Um, it's Great. been a pleasure to, to share what we know here. <laughs> awesome. Um, what we'll do is we'll just uh, quickly uh, wrap around the room then. Um, so Diane, I'll just ask you to stop sharing your screen. Perfect. And um, what we'll do is we'll just do a quick wrap around the room and say something about what you've uh, got out of the meeting and then tell us a little bit about yourself and then we can uh, go forth into the rest of our Friday. So um, let me just start with um, Natalie. I know you have to go soon. So uh, um, let's start with you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Stan. Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thank you so much, Angelie. That was really super informative. Thank you so much. And if I may have taken down your details, I'd like to just flick through an email through to you, uh, possibly Perfect. about something going forward for us. Thank you. So good. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So for those that don't know me, which no, you're, you're all know me, but anyway, I'll just give my little usual pitch. I'm Natalie from junk to go the relationship manager. So we basically operate Auckland wide seven days a week where we come to your premises, rental properties, offices, our friendly and fast truck team will give you a free quote, no obligation to remove any junk. Um, kind of junk that we remove while well, we just say just about anything, especially in this current time. <laughs> Well, that's one thing we can't remove is COVID, but we'll probably keep trying behind scenes with that. Um, in terms of how things are looking for us right now in level four, we obviously not been able to, to do much. However, our truck team are taking a well-deserved break, but we're working hard behind the scenes. So as we go into level three, whenever that may be, we can go hard. Um, so yeah, if you know anyone that would like to put rubbish in its place, we would love to connect. Thank you, Natalie Junk to go. Thanks, guys. Uh, Nigel. Thanks, Dan. And uh, thanks, Ainsley. Um, it was interesting. I was casting my mind back a few years ago where I went in on a contract project for six weeks, which ended up spanning three Christmases. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's kind of interesting that we probably would have run into a lot of problems nowadays with the changes, um, but that there were, there was one, one contract and then we modified it. So I guess we had an underlying agreement in place and they didn't have the skills that, for the project that was required. It was interesting. Um, and one aside for Natalie, I can think of a beehive building in Wellington that's full of rubbish that he's emptying out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, my name's Nigel, uh, Phoenix Consultancy. My focus is on back end systems and processes, all of those things where extra profits in your business are just hiding in plain sight. Um, things like your LinkedIn profile, your Google My Business profile, the CRM being segmented, every communication piece having a very clear call to action in it, um, staying in touch with your customers. How many of us have actually phoned all of our customers or contacts in the last two weeks? How are you? How can I help? Is there anything I need? Anything, anything you need? All right. And it's surprising. People will say, yes, actually, I need this done. Um, and it's by reaching out and using that communication uh, and things like you know, the GMBs and the LinkedIn's, those are just the natural options to do it. Uh, and I'm more than happy to share some information with people on how to do that stuff. Uh, so reach out. It's Nigel, Finance Consultancy. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Katie. Hi, everyone. Um, really enjoyed my first 10G Connect. Thank you so much, Ainsley, for your talk. Um, I am a copywriter and I've got a few subcontractors that help me. So it reminded me to have a look at those agreements. 
that I have with them. Um, I'm not sure if I'm quite ready to, to hire anybody just yet, but um, it was definitely very um, informative. Thank you. So um, I am a freelance copywriter and editor. Um, I focus on writing websites, blogs, case studies, ebooks, any other kind of meaty and meaningful content. I um, like to write for social enterprises, not for profits and any other organizations who are doing great things in their community. Um, it's great to see you all and I'd love to have a chat with anybody um, to see if I can help with any of your copywriting needs. That's Katie Wixon from Katie Wixon Copywriting and Editing. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Cheryl. Hi everybody, I'm Cheryl Dickerson from CherylDickerson.com and I am a credibility creator. So what is that you might ask? Well, I help coaches, entrepreneurs, small business owners to communicate with their niche, with their target audience. Uh, I believe that the best way to gain credibility and trust is through talking to people like we are now, face to face. And whilst there's absolutely a place for social media and other type of advertising, uh, I think that the strongest way to connect is either in a room full of people where you're the person up the front of the room talking or on webinars like this, which is obviously where we're going to be for a little while, perhaps. And so what I do is help people to understand what to say, how to say it, where to say it. So I'm actually um, so I run them in person, but I'm going to run a pilot of an online um, course. To, to test that out. And I'm actually looking for people who might like to be part of that pilot. There'll be a maximum of nine people. Um, there will be no charge. And what I would ask for in return is a commitment of five one hour slots uh, once a week, probably on a Thursday or a Friday morning early. If you're interested, please reach out to me. I'm just going to communicate with some people now and try and find some suitable dates. Uh, but it's just I want to trial it online like this rather than doing a five hour one day in person. I'm going to do five separate hours. So if you're interested, that's what I'm looking for. Or if you know someone else, then I'll put my contact details in the chat. Please reach out and let me know. Um, I will be starting it in the next probably 10 days is my plan. Thank you. Um, also, uh... Hi there, um, this is uh, Jorge, actually that's my name. <laughs> um, um, I would be interested in um, participating in the pilot project, by the way. Um, well, anyway, so my name is George. Um, I'm, I'm the director and founder of Salsa Roja. Uh, we focus in manufacturing uh, Mexican style um, food, like uh, the sauces, the salsa. And we also in the project of building a factory. So we are going to be uh, producing corn chips, uh, uh, tortillas and also we provide wholesale of tequila really good tequila <laughs> um yeah we are as we are expanding this um 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 video call was really um helpful because we are also in expanding and hiring some people um so it's always um good to know um uh, how can different parties and companies can help us um with this expanding you know like as a director there is so many things um, you need to look at, you know, marketing and legal stuff. And it's impossible to know everything for um, for all these um, stages in our um, company. So thank you, Aisley, for sharing this with us. Perfect. Diane. Hi, Diane. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute that. <laughs> Um, thanks so much, Ainsley. Um, that was really informative. Um, yeah, we do try and um, ensure that our documentation is in order, but it's always to try and keep up with everything is always the big thing. You've got to make sure that um, you have the latest and the greatest, and you never know when things are changing as well. So you certainly have a value-added service that you're providing. Um, and um, thanks, for Dan, for hosting this. Um, so I'm Diane from AppWorks, and um, our company believes in providing customers with uh, a competitive advantage um, by providing innovative um, technological solutions. So uh, what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, um, 
probably about the last two months, is going around the country. We've been down to New Plymouth and Taupo, Tauranga, um, and um, we've also been doing this on the North Shore, is speaking to moteliers about our casting product um, from your cell phone onto the TVs in the hotel room, your own content. So that is one of our big products that we are pushing, as well as um, we have another product, which is for camper vans or batches or um, out in the countryside, you know, uh, taking a travel kit with you so that you can just plug into your camper van or caravan or batch and um, you have your own content there. So um, pretty exciting times. And um, yes, we've been in contact with a couple of our, the people that we have on board that have got our G3 uh, costing system in the motels. And um, it, it's good to have a bit of a chat with them, feel really sorry for them. No business is obviously happening at this point in time. And we've taken the stance that we won't be charging them during this time. So um, we just we just want to try and support them as much as possible. So thanks, guys. Lovely to see you all. Cool. Uh, Baptist? It's good morning, Mr. Good morning, uh, PNG. This is Baptist from Tax Advantage. We help clients in their accounting, taxation, auditing, and valuation of businesses. We also provide business advisory service. I hope uh, Nat Natalie is left. I was thinking that Natalie could put COVID in the junk truck and take it out and throw it in the somewhere it will not come back. Unlike Nigel, I had a lot of clients calling me up because they wanted to first get their wage subsidy and research and payment. So all the time my phone was busy. So I, admit, I did not have the need to call them up. So they called me up. So that's Baptist from Tax Advantage. If you know anybody who is struggling in their business to get their cash flows, which is very important at this point of time, I, will, I can help them out. And also remember that uh, in a two days time, we have got provisional tax coming through and GST. So keep that, keep that in mind and have your cash flows ready. That's Baptist from Tax Advantage. Abby? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, yes, hi all. Sorry, my video is a bit off. I have got a lot of disturbance in the background, which you don't want to see, certainly. <laughs> So this is Abby from First Class Accounts, helping businesses with tax and compliance. Ainsley, that was such a great informative session and I would highly recommend Ainsley to all of you. I've dealt with her uh, in many, you know, many times, many occasions. And she is very professional, very thorough with what she does. Uh, she has helped some of my clients with employment. Uh, so if any of you have any issues, please give her a call. I help businesses with tax and compliance. As Baptist mentioned, we have been getting a lot of calls in terms of weight subsidy and COVID resurgence. The only thing I can say is, I know how difficult it is for a small business owner to manage their cash flow. Stay calm, stay together, and we are all here to help you. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Melanie, for setting up the Connect Online. Ainsley, you're a rock star. Fantastic. What a great presentation Thank and you. a superb value add to our members of the networking group. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Cheers. You're welcome, Gash. Good to see you. Uh, cool. Well, um, I am Dan. So uh, I run Ingot, which is a digital design studio uh, based in the Waikato. So what we do is we work with businesses to better communicate what they do on their website. Uh, through better design, but we also work on that better functionality as well, because your website is a tool. It needs to be useful and it needs to engage. So our dual clients are the ones that, you know, they have some additional functionality. They need a user dashboard where they can display all the documents to all their clients, or they need a membership space, or they need subscriptions, or they need to integrate with a third party system that they use to make their life easier and also make their websites more useful for their customers because 
that's the whole idea is uh, something that engages, that connects with the target audience, but then that's also useful um, so that people stay on the website and then Google loves websites that uh, people find useful. And then that's how you obviously grab the rankings. So that's a space that we love to work in is designing and developing custom websites for businesses. So that's me, Dan from Ingot and Melanie. Hi everybody, really nice to see you all connecting online. We, um, as you know, the networking group is all about connecting people. So it's actually very, very vital in times like this when we can't do it face to face, that we are meeting online and looking after each other, sharing our wins, our losses and our challenges. So thank you to all of you professionals who are out there doing it for everybody. And, and thank you Ainsley for sharing your, um, your, yeah, huge, huge, what a topic, but fabulous, thank you. Uh, I do encourage you all to invite your visitors um, along to your groups at the moment. It's a great time to include other people in your in your groups um, and help them to connect as well and, and feel included. So please reach out to, to anybody who'd like to come along to a TNG meeting. We won't be uh, putting any pressure on them to, to join. So we're here to help. Thank you. Great. Nice. Great. So um, thank you again, Ainsley. Um, appreciate, uh, oh, I mean, uh, it, really helpful to hear um, about uh, about your business and um, about the impact that you have on the businesses as well. So thank, um, you. thank you for sharing your advice and no doubt there will be people getting in contact with you. Um, with um, the TNG Online Connect, yes, it is um, it is a recorded session, so it will be available on the TNG YouTube channel. Um, and then obviously next fortnight, every Friday, 10.30, we'll be discussing um, and uh, continuing on with uh, the next guest speaker. Melanie, who, who is that next guest speaker? And sorry, you unmuted. I'm so glad you asked. That would be Dan Webster from Angle Design. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so I'll be telling, uh, I'll be sharing a little bit about um, how to actually target your website and uh, make it more useful. Um, so uh, yeah, that's going to be a great session. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, have a great weekend. Stay COVID free and uh, stress free too. So thanks everyone. Thank hey. you, Dan. Thank you. Great to see you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Great.